So that's a little snippet of what goes on. Uh, we play a bunch of crazy games, have some fun, but ultimately we talk about Jesus. We talk about living a life of faith. And so now this, this past school year, we kind of changed how we do school, or school ministry, youth ministry. Um, we took a, this model that I had heard about, and basically what we do is one night a month, or one or two nights a month, is we get up and we do a regular service like this. And the other two or three weeks, we invite them into Laney in my house, and we invite them into our space, and just talk life, talk about what we talked about. So we've been doing that for, it's been a couple months now, and it's working really well. We love it. The kids love it. Um, and a couple weeks ago, the week before Mother's Day, actually, I brought up this idea. It was our last big night, so to call it. I brought up this idea of starting an outbreak. And now some of you are probably like, wait a minute, is, is Pastor Andrew talking about starting an outbreak? Yes, I am, but hold on. <laughs> I'm not going to make you drink any Kool-Aid or anything like that. Don't worry. But here's the deal. There's this thing that we have. There's this thing that is so contagious that it can literally change the world. We know that this thing that I'm talking about that, that, that gets birthed inside of us is the gospel message of Jesus Christ. So I talked about this, this message that we have and how it's like a virus inside of us. Now some of you are like, wait, now he's comparing the gospel to a virus? Hold on. <laughs> a virus, by definition, is simply this. It's a small infectious agent that replicates itself only inside the living cells of an organism. So based on that definition, we can say that the gospel message is basically like a virus. It's a virus that gets placed inside of us but only replicates inside of us. But it's also a virus that is so contagious that the FBI, the CDC, the government, they can't stop its effect. They can sure try. I mean, we've, we're living in a world right now that is trying to suppress the Christian belief, suppress our faith, but they can never stop it. So I gave them this idea of starting an outbreak, starting an outbreak in their, in their school. That the, From there, it'll change the city. From there, it'll change the state, to the nation, to the globe. Gave them this idea of starting an outbreak, to let it out, to allow the Holy Spirit to use them strategically where they are, to minister to their friends and to their loved ones. See, we talked about how this virus, this thing that is, that is inside us, that it grows exponentially. I mean, how many of you know of the, I think it's the seventh wonder of the world, which is, um, help me out, Dave Gedkin, what is it called again? There it is, compound interest. And our faith, basically, when we share it, when we share the virus, our faith is like compound interest. Over time, it just keeps growing and growing based on the people that we share it with. And I made reference to this game that I don't know if any of you have played it. I, I know Scott and Nina, yeah, it's an awesome game. It's called Pandemic. And basically what happens is in this game Pandemic, you and your friends are on one team, so you win or lose together. So it's not a game that I would play with you, Pastor Dan, because I want to beat you. I <laughs> Just kidding. But anyway, so you're playing this game and you're trying to save the world, basically. And as these cards flip over, what happens is once this epidemic card flips over, you place this, uh, this cell of viruses basically in the city that's on the card. And it, but if that city is already full, what happens is that starts an outbreak in the next city. And then if that city becomes full after that, then it starts another outbreak in the next city. And I talked about how that's the life that we live. We have this virus inside of us that we don't know what's going to happen. All we're called to do is plant the seed and watch it grow. Let God do his thing. But I talked, we talked about how this virus that's inside of us grows exponentially. But see, this is where it affects us. This is where it affects us today. See, this generation coming up, Generation Z or iGen, depending on which, one, which uh, source you read, it's basically the, if you were born between 1995, 1996, through 2012 or 2013, to, like, again, based on what source you read, it would involve this generation. But see, this generation isn't like any of the generations that are prior. This generation is going to be filled with entrepreneurs, CEOs, these great thinkers, these people that want to make change. And this is where it falls on us because we here we have this generation that, that sees the issue at hand, that sees all these problems, but doesn't just sit down and complain about it. They want to actively participate, actively get involved. 
this next generation can change the world. See, they say this next generation will do anything and everything to help, the right, help right the wrongs done. They will do anything and everything possible to help everyone feel involved, help everyone feel loved. They want to see people get involved. They want to see churches and religious people start putting, where their mo- putting the money where their mouth is and start getting involved instead of just throwing money at a project. But they want to see service. They want to see steps taken forward to fix the problem. This next generation, it's gonna, it will change the world. It will. And this is where it falls on us is that we have the opportunity to help them change the world. We have the opportunity to help teach them how to share their faith, how to take this virus that's inside of them and start coughing, start sneezing, start sharing it. So today I want to continue the idea of starting an outbreak, but in our homes. So the title of my message that I promise will be out by noon, I'm just kidding, <laughs> no one laughs, it's, yeah, it's like, it's, whatever, <laughs> is creating a contagious home. Now, some of you are probably in the room, and you're either like Elaine and myself, and you don't have kids yet, or you're, you're past the stage of kids, or you're like, I don't even want kids, but here's the deal. This idea of creating a contagious home isn't just for parents of iGen or Gen Z, or the next generation, which is alpha gen. So you can only imagine what that's going to bring there. But anyways, we won't get into that. But this doesn't just apply to you parents. It applies to everyone. Because whether we like it or not, we will come in contact with a Gen Zer or an iGen. Whether we like it or not, we will have interaction with them. And it's our job to what? To show them what it's like to be a Christian. Because if our home is already contagious, you know what happens? When we're out in the workplace, when we're out at their school, when we're at the mall, when we're at the store, people see that light shining inside of you. People see that, that something's different about this person, and I want it. So this isn't just a message just for parents. This is a message that involves all of us. See, people get drawn to someone that, that has a contagious home that has a home that, that puts Christ at the forefront, that, that gives him all the praise, all the glory, all the honor, but then shares it. So before I get too far ahead of myself, there's three things we need to do to influence the next generation in a healthy way, but more importantly, in a biblical way. Step number one, our firm foundation has to be on the solid rock. We have to catch the virus to begin with. We have to catch the virus and keep our foundation on that firm rock. See, many of you have probably heard of the parable of the wise and the foolish builders. It's found in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, and it says, Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against the house, that house, it won't collapse because it is, because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains come and the floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. See, in order to lead our family, in order to lead a contagious home, in order to be noticed in this dying world, we have to keep our roots We have to put our foundation on the only solid rock there is. We have to keep our foundation on the only thing that that will survive the winds and the waves of life. We have to die to ourselves daily. We have to surrender to him daily. We have to allow his spirit to lead us and guide us. Because here's the truth. If our foundation is on the sand, if our foundation is not on the rock, we won't make it. We won't be able to have this contagious home. We won't be able to see this next generation change the world. Because if we don't have that foundation, how can we pass on that foundation? If we're more focused on what the world says than what the Bible says, how is that a foundation on the rock? 
How many of you have ever seen a, a tightrope walker? Anybody? So they're suspended, what, thousands, hundreds, hundreds, sometimes thousands of, of feet up in the air. And they're walking along this tightrope. I'm not even going to begin to try to, to walk out. I mean, there's no tightrope here, obviously. So I would just kind of fall, and it would be really funny. So maybe I will. No, I'm kidding. But anyway, so there's, these tight, there's a tightrope walker. Picture this with me. And they're walking across this ravine. They know their destination. They know where they're going. Their steps are methodical, and they're slow. See, that's just like in our lives. We know where we're going when we are on the solid rock. We know where we're going. It's not a, ra- it's not a run it's, or a marathon. We know how we need to follow that thin line, that line that, that is given to us by what? The Bible. But just like the tightroper, he, they battle with what? With balance. The same thing is true in our lives. As we're walking across this tightrope in our life, what tries to weigh us down? The world, our peers, our friends, our family members, our own mind. But tightrope walkers, they walk with what? They usually walk with a big pole, right? They either walk with a big pole or with their arms outstretched wide. Why? Because that helps them keep their balance. See, and that's what Christ does for us. Jesus gives us that balance point of where we can walk on that thin line and not have to worry about falling to the right or to the left. Now, does that mean that we're not going to be uh, that we're going to be perfect? No, absolutely not. There's not a single one of us in the room that would even begin to claim that we're perfect. But we walk this thin line. We have to keep our balance, and that balance is Christ the solid rock. See, too many times I've seen families, I've seen people who will let the influence of the world, let the influence of their peers, let the influence of their own mind cause them to fall off. When the wind starts hitting their house, when the waves hit their house, their boat gets rocked, their line gets rocked, and they fall off. They don't make it. But when our roots, when our foundation is on Christ, we will. See, our foundation has to be placed on the only thing that will sustain us in this life. Our foundation, our trust, our balance has to be centered on him and him alone. We have to understand that once we put our faith in the solid rock, once we catch the virus, once we start believing like, yes, God, I'm going to trust you, I'm not going to listen to them, it doesn't stop there, does it? Which leads me to my next step. Step number two, which is study read and pray we have to let the virus duplicate itself inside of us in scripture we read about developing our faith for a couple of reasons number one to to what fend off the false prophets to fend off those people that are are spewing absolute nonsense and calling it scripture in second peter chapter 3 verse 17 we we read that you already know these things dear friends so be on guard then you will not be carried away by the errors of these wicked people and lose your own secure footing. Rather, you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're warned against these false teachers. We're warned against these people that will take the Bible and twist it for their own, for their own good, for their own purpose. But if our roots are firm and if we study Scripture, we will know that, hey, this guy's spewing a bunch of nonsense, right? So we're told to study. But we're also told to know Scripture. Why? So we can grow, a, grow in faith with him and get a deeper understanding of who Jesus really is. I mean, we've heard the passage that says, draw closer to me as what? As I draw closer to you. Again, in Second Peter, we can read, but this time in chapter 1, verse 8, it says, The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. So, dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you really are among these that God has chosen. Do these things and you will never fall away. Grow to know the scripture. 
know his voice so that we can truly prove that we are chosen, that we are children of God. We're told to study, read, and pray. See, how can we hear the Holy Spirit's leading and guiding if we don't take time to listen for his voice? How can we hear and trust that this truly is God if we don't take the time of day to give him a moment to speak? How can we? We can't. We have to allow his spirit. We have to give him time. We have to say, God, I'm listening even when I don't want to. Even when my kids are yelling at me, even when my wife or my husband is yelling at me to get up, whatever. Now, there's a time and place for when you can do your devotions. And there's no, there's no, if you do your devotions in the morning, then you're better than others. If you do your devotions at night, no, there's no secret sauce to doing your devotions except just doing them. Our job is to grow deeper in him. See, the same God who commanded Joshua In chapter 1, verse 8, he says, Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on on it, excuse me, day and night, so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. Only then will you succeed and prosper in all you do. See, that's the same God that's calling out to us today. That God that was telling Joshua, hey, you can do this. I have put this inside of you so you can do this. This was just after Joshua was basically handed the mantle and said, you're going to take the Israelites and you're going to do this. And Joshua's this little kid like, what? And God is saying, no, because when you meditate on my scripture, and when you put this in the forefront of your mind, and you trust in me and you believe in me, but you grow deeper in your understanding of me, that is when you will prosper. That's the same God that is speaking to us today. That is the same God that that caused David to write in Psalm 119, verse 105, Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. See, I've seen so many people that that call themselves Christians, myself included. When I was a junior junior high and high school student, you know what my excuse was for not taking this my faith deeper. I was basically shallow. And I've seen so many people that were just like me that said, no, I'll just wait till next week or or next year or when I'm older. And I've seen way too many people that don't take that next step deeper into the water with him. I've seen too many people that that struggle with realizing that it's more than just saying, God, I give you my life and la da da, I'm done. That is not what it means to be a Christian. What it means to be a Christian is to accept Christ, obviously. Put your feet and your your foundation firm on him. But then it's to pray. It's to study. It's to read. It's to hear his voice. Because the next step and the next thing that we are called to do as Christians is to share it. We're called to be willing to disciple, to mentor, to spread the virus. I mean, after all, there's this, this little thing called the Great Commission, right? The Great Commission doesn't just apply to Pastor Dan, myself, evangelists. It applies to everyone. So it's our duty, it's our job to share the virus. It's our duty, it's our job to get in the Word so that we know what it says so we can share it. Our job is to start sneezing. See, one of the most important parts of being a Christian, of living like a Christian, of this Christian deal, let's say, is to share it. I mean, Jesus didn't just just say, all right, this is for you guys, and um, there you go. You don't have to share it with anybody, right? No. He tells us, go. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and make them disciples. Disciples. See, we're told in, um, wow, I lost my spot bad. (laughs) We're told in Scripture that what? We're going to be disciples and we're going to make disciples to what? The ends of the earth. This isn't just something that is for Shawano. This isn't just something that's for Wisconsin or the United States. We're called to continue to make disciples all the way till Jesus comes. To everyone, anyone and everyone. 
we're called to share this virus. We're called to be willing to share, to take the time, to say to people, to say to the Gen Zers, to the iGen, the same thing that Paul wrote, follow me as I what? Follow Christ. We're called to disciple, to mentor. Like I said, we're called to sneeze, to cough, to pass it on. See, now this doesn't mean, like I said, that we'll be perfect. This doesn't mean that that when we accept it, it's going to be easy. But what it does mean is that in our, in our humanity, when we fail, fail fast. If you fail hard, fail fast. Get up and keep moving. You know how many times I've said, even from the, <laughs> the platform, oh, I probably shouldn't have said that. But the, our job is to fail fast. To realize that, yes, we will make mistakes. We will say the wrong things. We will do the wrong things. We will let our anger take over. Sometimes, I mean, I, I haven't experienced this yet. Sometimes it's, I, rem- <laughs> I remember my parents that jokingly they would say, in Jesus' name, smack. <laughs> now that's a little different. But seriously, we will make mistakes. We will let our anger get the best of us. We will teeter to one side or the other at times as we're walking this tightrope. But our job isn't to be perfect Our job is to be obedient. Our job is to put our feet on the solid rock. Our job is to let it duplicate inside of us, to read, to study, to pray. But then our job is to also share. And as the worship team comes up, I'd like everyone to go ahead and bow your heads. Hey everybody, Pastor Dan here, and we want to say thank you for watching today's message. We hope that it was a great, great blessing to your life. And for those of you who may have invited Jesus Christ into your heart for the very first time today, we want to say welcome to the family of God, and we want to get a five-day devotional into your hands. And you could receive that by contacting the church office or speaking to an usher the next time you're at River Valley or even shooting us an email. And that would help us be able to get you started on your journey of faith in Jesus Christ. For those of you who are an ongoing part of the River Valley family and would like to help us continue leading people into a vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ, we would ask that you would consider giving online and you can do that by following the link right here on our website. And the final thing I wanna say is God bless you and have a great day.